So before we get into today's video, let's go ahead and set the scene a little bit. Because ever since I first started my medical journey, before I became a doctor, we're talking eight years ago now at this point, when I first entered my undergrad of biomedical sciences, I remember hearing talks about doctor shortages. You would talk to different students that were interested in medicine, different patients, you would overhear them talking about doctor shortages, and every now and then you would turn on the nightly news and you would see a physician on the TV talking about doctor shortages, but that there were plans in place and they were hopeful and optimistic that things would change over the course of the next 10 years. Fast forward to 2022, however, and what we're still seeing is that the double AMC still says that America could have in excess of 100,000 physician positions that they need to fill by 2033 and in Canada what we're seeing right now is that there are thousands of patients without access to primary care physicians and other doctors all this to say that from where I'm sitting right now we still do not have the answer to this problem and with that we're going to get started so how's it going everybody welcome back to the channel my name is Junluca aka Dr. Calcagno and I'm a first year family medicine resident working and studying here in Canada for today we are going to tackle the physician shortage the lack of doctors and what that means so one of the big things that I've noticed in spending a lot of time now basically in my presence online and making videos is that there has been a growing reluctance from content creators to talk about topics that are difficult or controversial in some aspects because of the fear of criticism from people that have different opinions than you. Now, as a scientist and as a doctor, I don't think this is helpful at all. And that's why I've decided that as time goes on and I continue to learn more and more about the topic that is medicine that I've chosen basically to dedicate my entire career to, that I will continue to speak on more difficult topics whenever I feel like I have something useful and educational to add to the conversation. But I think that the most important part about all of this is that I open it up to the public. And whenever I make a video like this, I need to hear from you guys. If you agree with me, if you disagree with me, go ahead and let me know. For today, if you do think that there is a physician shortage, go ahead and give me some proposed solutions. Do you agree or disagree with what I'm saying? How can we fix it? And if you don't think that there's a physician shortage, tell me about it. I'd love to know where are you living right now? What area are you looking at? And what is the current climate like in terms of doctors and the relative access to medicine? And what made your area so unique in that there is no physician shortage there? So the first thing that I think we need to do, it's very important, is define our terms. We're gonna take physician shortage and break it down because what I feel like a lot of people don't know is that when you talk about physician shortage, what you're really getting at is at least three different separate problems that might have their own solution for each of the different problems. Now, the first thing to consider is what's known as a relative specialty shortage. And basically what this means is that when you look at the data, what we're seeing is that shortages of doctors are way more pronounced in some specialties compared to other specialties. And for example, when you look at recent data out of the States, what you're seeing is that around 84 million Americans are living in areas without adequate access to primary care providers. Those being for the most part, uh, family doctors, primary care pediatricians, and in some areas, adequate access to emergency services. Now, the data in Canada is not any better. And I would actually argue being a primary care provider resident, a family medicine resident myself here in Canada, you're seeing that there are thousands of people without access to family doctors. And you'll hear their stories, whether you're in the emergency department or families that just delivered a new baby and they don't have any doctors to take over care for their newborn baby. There definitely is a primary care provider shortage across both Canada and the United States. And we see that as well in terms of students that are getting out of medical school and what fields they're choosing to pursue. And when we look at the most recent data for the 20 2022 match here in Canada, we see that of all of the available spaces, there were 99 unfilled positions for family medicine. And that is showing that basically many students are choosing not to get into that field upon graduating from school. After both iterations of the match have completed, there still are not people that decided to go into that field. Now, the second thing you have to consider is what's known as a relative geographic shortage. And basically what this means is that when students from medical school are graduating from these programs, where do they choose to actually set up practice afterwards and live the rest of their life and actually provide their medical service to the community? And what you're seeing is that when students get out of medical school, way more of them will tend to stay in the big cities like downtown Toronto, for example, and a relative few will trickle to the more rural areas, especially in some of the more rural and far away areas, for example. In Ontario, it's places like Moose Factory that even though their population is relatively lower than the big cities, if there are no doctors that are going up to these rural areas 
areas to practice medicine there, then those areas will still, regardless of how many students we are pumping through the system, have a relative geographic shortage of doctors up that way. And then finally, the third thing you need to consider is what happens when I take both of those two things we just talked about and I combine them together? What happens when I take a relative specialty shortage and I combine it with a relative geographic shortage and in my opinion, I feel like unless we come up with a proper solution, you're going to continue to see these most pronounced examples of physician shortages in those specific areas for those specialties. Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at some of the proposed solutions and try and understand why I am just a little bit skeptical about thinking that a problem as complicated as this has a one-tiered solution in this case. For many years now, I've had opportunities to speak to pre-medical students, medical students, and even doctors about different solutions. And one of the solutions that I've heard, especially from the pre-medical students, and medical students is just to increase the amount of seats that we have available in universities in both Canada and the United States in terms of letting students get into medical school. And at first glance, it makes total sense. We need doctors, we have positions for doctors, and we have students that are interested in becoming doctors. So just increase the amount of seats and we'll get those people to be doctors and everything should be good. Now let's go ahead and take a look why I don't think that this one solution is the full answer to this problem. What we know for sure and looking at the data is that every year there are students in Canada and the United States that go unmatched after the first and second iterations for the residency match. What this means is that we've had students that have applied to multiple different programs in multiple different areas. Many students will apply to 20 or more different programs and after getting rejected twice now, they are still choosing to go unmatched after those two iterations of the match, even though what we're also seeing is that at the end of both cycles, there are still open spaces for family medicine. Those students had the opportunity to apply to family medicine in many cases and have chosen not to. Now, to me, this totally invalidates the argument that what we should be doing is increasing the amount of students that get into medical school and only increase the residency spaces in programs like family medicine, for example, and just tell the students that these are the only spots you have available and you need to go ahead and match into those if you want to work in medicine. Because what we're seeing is that even when those spaces are available, people would rather go without a job as a doctor than get into those specialties. And what we will create at the end are just an increased amount of students that will choose to go into private industry, that will choose to go to other countries, and that will choose to do things like start their own business and not actually work in the fields that we had intended them to go into in the first place. I really do think that people tend to undervalue the MD degree. They don't understand just how many jobs there are available to MD candidates outside of medicine. Things like big pharma, things like private business, there are many opportunities that do become available to you. And what I am starting to learn more and more is that really, it is very, very difficult to force a doctor to do something that they don't want to do because of how many positions there are in different fields. But for a moment, let's pretend you could. Let's pretend you could force people to do a specific specialty. And I had a student that ever since they were a teenager really wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. So they worked their butt off to get into medical school. And then when they were in medical school, they did many different electives with orthopedics. They put out orthopedic research and all they thought about was orthopedics the entire time. And at the very end, we now force them to go into family medicine by some means. Is it then realistic for me to assume that that person is going to enjoy their job as a family medicine doctor? And then furthermore, if I can't expect them to enjoy their job, then how am I supposed to expect them to work for 40 or 50 years and see thousands of patients on a yearly basis as is expected by a family doctor in order to meet the needs of both society? Basically, what I'm trying to say is that we should not be forcing medical students to get into certain specialties, but rather should be incentivizing students to get into the specialties that we perceive are at the highest need right now. We should be giving these students options and making sure that they are aware of certain specialties and aware of benefits of choosing certain specialties. And if those benefits aren't there right now, then maybe we should start thinking about making those benefits available to certain specialties in certain regions especially. Now there are so many more solutions that have been proposed in order to tackle this problem. We're just going to list a few off the top of our head because I can't spend so much time on every single thing. I do want to talk about my solution just a little bit and I'd love to hear your feedback too. I don't think it's 100% right, but I think we need to have a starting block to jump off of and that way we can refine it and go back and forth. Is this right? Is this wrong? And again, the importance of hearing everyone's feedback as well. So now rapid fire, three proposed solutions that are actually currently being explored and my immediate thoughts about them. Number one is taking internationally trained doctors and using them to fill the need that we have here in Canada and the United States. Immediately, there's nothing really wrong with them and I do think there is some sort of uh, 
use that this solution has for us. But at the same time, something does rub me the wrong way about having students that grew up in Canada and the United States, wanted to become doctors their entire life, and now don't have the opportunity because these spots were filled by foreign doctors. Something about that, I would like to see Canadians and Americans that have already taken on so much debt in the hopes of becoming doctors, to have spots available to them if that need is there. Proposed solution number two that I've heard been floating around is to come up with medical schools that are specifically designed to have students go into family medicine. And what I mean by that is that you would technically be accepted into medical school and be told from the very beginning that you could only possibly be a family doctor after graduating from that medical school. I don't think this is a good idea. Number one, it increases stigma around primary care. And also you cannot force people to work hours that they don't want to work. So if someone graduated from that program, they could still, nothing to stop stopping them from working 10 or 15 hours a week and doing other things. They can still graduate from there and it doesn't actually solve the problem of making sure that these people are working in the places that we had intended them to go into in the first place. That's why I do not think that that is a good solution either. And then the third proposed solution is just to get rid of primary care altogether and to fill that need with allied health professionals. I do think that allied health professionals, midwives, nurse practitioners, PAs are very, very important to our system. And I can't imagine where our system would be right now without them. But at the same time, I do think that there is a danger about devaluing family medicine and primary care because at the end of the day, as a graduate of a family medicine residency program, I will be more than qualified to work in urgent care, to deliver babies, to run private practice, to see mental health concerns. There is so much that my training will be able to qualify me for, and I am very, very skeptical about further devaluing primary care physicians in the long run. Okay, so that was a lot to talk about. I feel like we did a good job of breaking everything down as a pretext for this final solution. Keep in mind, like any other discussion, it's a nuanced answer that I've come up with. So pick it apart in the comment section below, but I think we need at least a four pronged approach to tackling this issue, which is physician shortage. But we're gonna make it quick. Number one, we need more medical students. We need students in medical school if they want to become doctors. The need is there. The want to become a doctor is there. Let's get the students in the school if that option is available to us. Point number two is let's incentivize doctors to go and work in areas where the need is greatest, especially in these rural places where there is not much infrastructure, there is not much room for travel or transportation. We need some sort of other financial incentive in terms of increasing pay or tax incentive in terms of saving money in the long run for choosing to work and set up practice in these specific locations where the need is greatest. Number three, we have to incentivize healthcare workers and doctors, especially to work long hours if that need is there, especially if there's a shortage. Right now, if you have a doctor, for example, that makes $300,000 a year and they're happy to not work double that in order to make a few extra hundred thousand dollars because they know they're going to get crushed in taxes anyways well then we need a way to incentivize them to work those longer hours and if that's through things like talking about private practice i know that is a taboo subject in and of itself we need to find a way to get doctors to get back to working long hours especially in primary care if they are not doing that already and if they are we need to reward them for doing so and finally if all of those things are being done already and there is still a need then we do need to look into how we could take doctors that have trained internationally and get them up to date with the canadian system make sure that their credits have transferred properly and that there is a good kind of highway for them to move from one system to the other to get accustomed to the canadian system and how things are currently being run here and down in the states as a family medicine resident myself the entire point of me making this video is to get the conversation going. We need to find some sort of solutions to these problems that we've identified for decades at this point in order for our patients to find access to healthcare because it really doesn't do anything for me to just talk about these things. I need to see some sort of action being put into place so that I could go down to the emergency department for my shift and not need to have so many discussions with people that are there unfortunately because they haven't seen a family doctor in more than 10 years because it wasn't possible for them to do so. But anyways that is the entire video. Please share your feedback with me. Thank you all for listening. We will see you all in the next one and everyone take care.